Hey, what's up guys? It's Mark Yoon, and today I'm bringing you another hopefully exciting video. So, um, I'm sure as a lot of you are aware, there were a lot of rumors that are surrounding Xbox Scarlet codename ever since um, E3. So, I want to delve into a, a couple of them, and I also want to go into what that actually may possibly end up meaning for the rest of the gaming community if these both be true. Uh, so let's just sit back and uh, have a discussion about it. By the way, if there's anything that you guys want to record in the comment section down below, I'm more than happy to read them. And um, all right, so let's start off with um, her name Scarlett. So there's a rumor. It's not even a rumor. It's, pre it's pretty much at this time like being speculated by uh, most uh, tech agencies and stuff like that that they are going to release two Xboxes in the next generation, and they're apparently slated for 2020, which is no big shock to me because I've been saying this for the past two years, the next consoles are going to come out probably in 2020. Um, so the codename Scarlett's apparently, uh, these are based on fear of uh, Phil Spencer's mention that he wants to get uh, all games by developers to be played by all two uh, million gamers. So this has a lot to do with Paul's platform, but also has a lot to do with streaming, and that goes into um, this actual, like, whatever it is. So. Apparently, on the next Xbox, there's going to be two different versions uh, that, that's being speculated. Uh, there's going to be a single um, optical disc-based drive, you know, the, the standard console version. And then there's going to be a much lower price or cheap point streaming box, which will pretty much just have access to uh, Xbox cloud services, so you can um, download games onto the, the box, sort of like a set-top box, like a Roku stick or an Amazon Fire or something like that. Uh, Amazon Kindle, sorry. Uh, so you can... It'll pretty much be like one of those like you only can play your digital streaming games. Like you, you won't have any that much hardware actually on the box. Like there's not going to be that much localization for for RAM or for GPU or anything like that. They're just actually going to stick to basics so you can stream. Um, this is a little foreboding and telling of what the future brings. I have mixed feelings on it, but more towards. Um, the negative, I guess. All right, um, little background. I have, I don't have an Xbox One. I have uh, a PS2, a PS3, a PS4, um, a 3DS, and a Switch. So I don't really have that much um, like say over what how the Xbox One runs or anything like that. I've played it a bunch of times. I just don't own one. Uh, I haven't owned an Xbox since the 360 because I had five of them that went through Red Rings of Death, including the Elite, and that was the final straw for me. So I never. Went back to Microsoft. Um, this can help and can hurt them. So let's talk about that first. The idea of offering a set top box alongside of uh, an X a regular Xbox is probably projection from speculation of their sales numbers because they've seen how the Xbox One has done alongside of you know giants like the PS4 and the Switch. Um, this is more appealing to. Um, Asian markets as well that play games a lot differently than us and as long as uh, a lot of you guys have been following Xbox's trends and sales know that uh, they're all but extinct in Asia so in South Korea and Japan which are two of the largest gaming communities in the world uh, there's no Xboxes and you know China's mostly mostly PC based gaming um, they have both actually all three of those countries are they have like internet cafes where people go to um, uh, I mean, there's, they still sell a lot of PlayStations there, but it's nowhere near the amounts of, like, it would be. So, as a competitor to that, I can see them opening it up in other regions as a cheaper device. Uh, let's say, let's call it 100 bucks. Um, it may also have some benefits for people like me who don't play Xbox anymore, but do want to play, I guess, the exclusives that they have. Um, not that there are, they are few and far between. Um, and maybe some of the games that I want to play with my friends that have Xbox, because Sony's pretty staunch on not allowing cross-platform, which I think they're going to ease up on that. I think the only thing they're going to do is say our first-party games, obviously, are not going to be cross-platform, obviously, because they're first-party, um, but probably more of the uh, arenas and stuff like that. They'll probably, at some point, like I know if they've definitively pretty much said no, but it's going to hurt them going into the next round, so I don't think they want to lose their edge that they have. Because um, we all know that the edge doesn't have anything to do with power or anything like that. PlayStation Library does have a huge amount of exclusives and a lot of great exclusives that keep the console going. 
Plus, they have a lot of other third-party developer studios under their belt. So they have a lot of good quality content coming out. And as somebody who plays like a lot of anime games and stuff like that, you don't do that on Xbox. Like, it's just like not what it's for. I remember when I had the 360, it was like a huge deal that um, that Blue Dragon was coming out, that Akira Toriyama art style uh, RPG, because like not many anime games came out for it. I believe there was a couple of the Storm games and, you know, like the basic Dragon Ball games. But anything outside of like Dragon Ball One Piece or Naruto, like you're not really dealing with much. And, um, so the streaming can help like people like me who aren't going to probably get the next gen Xbox, but would definitely consider getting one just for the streaming aspect, especially if the Xbox One cloud uh, allows for the backwards compatible games, like uh, if I can play some 360 games or even some original Xbox games via the cloud, like through streaming, I may actually consider that. Um, recently, I've actually considered picking up another 360 just to play those games. But, um, so that's a good point of it. There's a lot of uh, negativity though that's around it as well. Like I feel like developers and um, and like the consoles themselves, the, the tech companies really want to go towards digital only because it will cut down hugely on uh, production costs. And they know that the game sales won't dip nearly as much as like that will allow them to hurt them or the gaming industry. Um, I know I am a physical person. Not <laughs> that sound. Really, uh, really weird. Okay, so my games, my disc-based things, I prefer physical. Like, I'd rather have it, hold on to it, be able to trade it in when I want, or let a friend borrow it, than you know, just like having all my thing collecting dust and like never be able to get any credit for it when I'm done playing it. Um, that case in point, though, I'm kind of a hypocrite when it comes to that because about 90% of my collection is digital. <laughs> like, I think I on my uh, PS3, I have a. Um, a terabyte hard drive, and I think I have about like 200 digital games on there, and I only have like five on disc. Uh, same with the PlayStation 4, I have a two terabyte hard drive in my system, and I only have I think about six or seven games that are physical, and the majority, I'd say more than 20 or 30, are digital. <laughs> but um, that's mainly because of sales and stuff like that. Like, I, I've never bought a day one game digital only. That's never happened. Like, I usually. I pre-order it, I get it from Amazon or Best Buy or GameStop, um, even though I'm not really a huge fan of some of those companies, but uh, I do tend to try and pick up physical. Um, this will hurt that because here's what I feel like they're doing. I feel like since they know that they can cut costs and they can keep profit margins high, if they're going to be selling the games at retail for the same price they are on a disc base, but they don't have to pay for those actual discs and the manufacturing costs and the shipping costs and they know people are going to buy it anyway, they want to see a digital-only future. Like, they're the ones pushing that. Like, as, as far as I've seen, m most consumer base, like, wants physical discs. But the majority of, you know, the, the devs, they want to go, obviously, to cut costs, and they can put more money into their games, blah, blah, blah. But when you offer a streaming box alongside your hardcore box, what you're doing is saying, we're setting up future statistics. So what they're probably going to do is say, well, I think the time for digital only gaming and streaming is now because look at the sales of this Xbox streaming device as compared to our mainline hardline system with the optical drive and all that stuff. So the problem that lies in that is like statistics for that could be like, I don't want to say altered or tweaked, but kind of like misinformed um, due to the market constraints because Think about if you're a parent and you like have kids and you're trying to get an Xbox for your kids because they want one because they want to play like Fortnite or whatever. The main um, thing you're going to look at is price and cost. As a parent, you're not going to want out and go buy a five, a four or five hundred dollar console when you can just buy like a hundred dollar box and throw it in the room and they can just buy all their games online. And you don't have to worry about them going to stores and stuff like that. So, and that, that also goes into kids like young, younger teens who really can't really afford like all the major systems. That's like pretty. Um, easily accessible price entry to, to grab that. Um, and also, it's going to sell well because of the play people that are loyal to either Nintendo or PlayStation or both. Um, not that I really hold company loyalty per se, I hold, uh, I guess, like, quality like loyalty. So, like, if they, like, I would probably get the set-top and not the, like, the full one because, like, 99% of my games I would get, I would get on the PlayStation as opposed to the Xbox and the ones that, like, my friends would push really for 
uh, perhaps like, uh, for instance, Ark. Like I'd want to play Ark on an Xbox as, as opposed to PlayStation because like most of my my brother and a lot of his friends like they play on the PC and the Xbox, and I have no way of playing with them because there's no crossplay between the PlayStation 4 versions. So I haven't even bothered picking it up yet. Um, that's just rambling, though. Stuff like that, though. Um, so I mean, I feel like it's going to affect the sales numbers overall, and they're going to like point to it and say like, well, you guys say that you want digital only, but these statistics show otherwise because this set-top box is far outweighing like the, our original um, hardware, which you can also see at a price point because like anybody that wants to get into that market or into that gaming or young kids that are asking their parents or grandparents that don't know what they're getting for their grandkids or other console players who are just trying to play some games with their friends, um, there's a lot of like overarching like factors that will lead into those that set top box being like the better selling of the units which may like lead them to manipulate people into saying that it sells better so we want it more so they're going to focus mainly on that as opposed to like revamping that like maybe we'll see um a set top box that comes out a little bit later um in the cycle after that that actually has like some more power behind it that you can do some more things like with as opposed to just streaming your games and like Netflix and all that stuff. So I don't know, that, that's going to set like a really bad precedent if that happens and hopefully, like I don't think Nintendo is going to go digital only anytime soon, um, but uh, I don't know, PlayStation and Xbox have this like weird relationship where they like chase and follow each other where one will make a really bad decision, the other one will take full advantage of it and jump way ahead, and then like the other one just gets left in the dust. And then it, it flops and, and flips, it, it waxes and wanes. PlayStation 3, we all know, was raised at, at least at like a huge price point, it was like $6.99 or something like that, and like... I mean, it was because of the backwards compatibility and a lot of other like over extenuating factors, but it was mainly they were losing money based on the consoles because they were making them at too high of a price point. Um, until they dropped down to the slim and got out rid of backwards compatibility. But by that point, Xbox had already like held a huge market, especially since uh, 360 came out like well close to a year before the PlayStation 4. So I don't know. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's involved with uh, the, the two consoles, and I don't want to really get into um, too much of the semantics of opinions. I just wanted to get the facts. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Do you think that you would get the set top box version or the regular version? Is this going to set a bad precedent in, in your mind? Are you uh, kind of nervous about like the future of digital only gaming? And um, how does that like affect you personally? I mean, they're the biggest thing that affect that gets me is like if it's online only and like you're streaming stuff. As soon as those servers get shut down, you don't have access to the game. Like, at least on PlayStation 2, I can pop in a disc and play it, even though the servers are shut down because, like, I own the actual disc. Um, especially nowadays with games with, like, huge day one updates and patches and stuff like that, it's, like, I'm kind of nervous to think of when the servers get shut down when you're trying to go play your PS3 game or PS, like, 4 game even, like, 10 years in the future, like, are you going to be able to do so? Um, but that's a video for another time. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. As always, stay powered up. Peace.